how do we lay ourselves before you? Father, may our, our minds be uh, ready for that. May our hearts be ready for that. Uh, the things that distract us throughout the week, may they be pushed aside. And uh, may we be fully present and dwell with you just for a short time. Father, help us to be still and know that you are God. Help us to be here. Right here, right now. Father, we, we come together now as one body, with one voice, saying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, our Lord, our Lord, our Lord,
Father, we know that you hear our prayers. We know that you hear our confession. And Lord, we also know that we are forgiven through the high cost and the work of Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. John wrote that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. We are forgiven because of Jesus Christ and him alone. Let us be fully thankful and respond with grace.
the Sunday school answer. It's the, the church answer.
anthem today is, is For the Beauty of the Earth. It is hymn number two in your hymn books. There are five verses. You are more than welcome to join us on the fifth verse. Love to have you. And I won't say it's a choir audition. <laughs>
And we have a couple weeks yet, though, this week and, and next week, uh, to, look at, to look at a couple more questions. Uh, and I thought the one I picked for this morning kind of fit with being thankful, with the, with the theme of Thanksgiving. And uh, that would be the question that, that we're looking at this morning is, how, how do you have assurance of salvation? And I, I think when looking at this question, first we have to look at whether there is, in fact, assurance of salvation to be had. Is salvation assured or guaranteed? As with all things, as with anything, as, a, as Christians, we go to Scripture. And there are, there are many verses that could be looked at. There's verses in the Old and the New Testament. But there's, there's only maybe a couple that I'm going to focus on uh, this morning, a few of them. Now we're going to, I'm going to use a good amount of scripture, but as, the, as kind of the source for the main scripture, there will only be a few. The, and the main passage that we're kind of using is from Ephesians. Uh, one of Paul's letters to the church in Ephesus. Uh, and these were Christians. And, and we see in these verses, in Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, and he talks about, uh, you know, in him we have obtained an inheritance, uh, predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Uh, and we also... He says, this is when you heard the word of truth and the gospel, you, you believed in him, and you were sealed with this promised Holy Spirit, who is, he says, the guarantee of our inheritance. And if we look at this passage, we see that those of us that are in Christ have obtained an inheritance. And this was given to us through Jesus and his work of complete obedience to God's will. This came through hearing God's word and believing in Christ as our Lord and Savior. And, and this resulted then with the Spirit, this a sealing of this inheritance by the indwelling Spirit. The Spirit is what seals it. The Holy Spirit came to dwell within all who believe, and He seals them. Here. And this is this is from the context uh, in that culture where there would be a seal on ro uh, royal documents. They would have like a wax seal, and there would be a ring that would make a mark on that seal for identifying who exactly authorized or was the one sending this that sealed this letter. And this, this is what the early church would have thought about when Paul is using this term. And then Paul says that the Spirit is the guarantee of the inheritance. And this guarantee, or what we could also call a down payment or a deposit, it is something that holds the position. It holds it. Uh, we do this all the time. When, when something is to be saved for later use or ownership, we put a deposit or a down payment on it. And those of us that own homes place a down payment on them as part of becoming owners of it, hopefully, <laughs> eventually. The, and, and that is what the Holy Spirit does with those that are believers. Paul wrote the same idea in, in his, church, his letters to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22, he talks about all the promises of God. And then he says in verse 22 that who, he put his seal on us and giving given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And if we just, if we sit with that for a minute, this gives us our assurance. And some, some might say, what if uh, the full payment isn't paid to bring us into the salvation at the end of our life? What if that doesn't come to fruition? What if it's not uh, taken all the way? And that, that would be a good question if we're talking about human economy. Uh, but this is God's economy and, uh, that we're dealing with. And you see, the Holy Spirit is the promise from God, and he doesn't take back any promises. We know that. Paul is clearly saying that there is, there is an assurance or guarantee of salvation. And this is made sure by the, the very presence of the Spirit of God. The second part that, of this that 
uh, kind of wanted to look at is to be sealed by the Spirit. How, how can we know that we are sealed by the Spirit? And, you know, can there be a sort of a false assurance? And I think, again, we go to Scripture and we can read in uh, John's first letter, he gives many things that kind of give evidence of this assurance, of this sealing, of having the Spirit. In, in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, he says we will keep His commandments. In chapter 2, verse 29, he says that those that have the Spirit will practice righteousness. And in John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, he says in verses 6 through 10, no one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as He is righteous. Whoever makes it a practice of sinning is of the devil. And he goes on and speaks of no one being born of God makes a practice of sinning. And if, we're, if God's seed abides in him, he cannot keep on sinning. And then at the end of verse 10, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And as we go into the next chapter of 1 John chapter 4, it seems to be a pretty good theme in 1 John, um, in the end of verse 7, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Later on in chapter 4, he says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. John writes that, that we will know that we are Christian because of the Spirit. We will confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We will confess Him as our Savior. We it, it does take more than just confession, though. It is more than words. And many, many people will say uh, things and not really mean it. We know that. Uh, we hear it all the time. There, there will be an internal change, though. There will be something different. This, the Spirit brings God's perspective on things. And there will be a change. The, Spirit, the, the fruits of the Spirit, we read from Galatians 5, where, our love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, they will be a part of us now. And anything that goes against these things will, will be felt much deeper within the Christian heart. We will, we will feel things as God does, not fully as He does, I don't think we can handle that. But He will help let us feel what He feels, see what He sees. We, we will live differently, revealing these fruits. Of the Spirit, but but again, not perfectly, because we're still here. We still have this sin nature, and this change will continue, though. And there will be a consistent practice of righteousness. It, it, there won't be a consistent practice of sinning and being okay with it. There will be a true following of the commandments of God uh, that are given by God and Jesus. And there will be a pretty consistent battle, though. And we talked about this in Sunday school, that there, there is still this battle that goes on. And there, there's still, there are still times where I go against God, where I fall into sin once again. And, and I even go into it knowing very well that there is nothing that satisfies or fulfills within it. It's just the temporary satisfaction or gratification and it's so empty, and I know this, and yet there's still, it's, it's so stupid, God. And it's, there's still this draw because of this sin nature that battles the spirit within us, that we won't be perfect in this. We desire God's rule, but we, but we also want to serve ourselves. We, you know, we deserve, we deserve a break today, right? 
<laughs> you roll. Um, and uh, you know, the, the fruit won't always be fully outwardly evident. Sometimes, sometimes this can cause us to get down and, and even move away from God and His truths and to, to kind of wallow in our misery and kind of you know, look at ourselves as worthless. And uh, We see what we do and it, it looks like at times that the very, you know, the very little evidence of the Spirit being there, of living within us. And now there can, be kind of false, there can be a false assurance that comes from faulty thinking though. We can, we can think that because we do all the right things, that we are secure, that we have this assurance that we are fully saved. And, you know, that's a, really a works-based security. And that is faulty. And there, there's one person that gives this illustration. I think I got, yeah, I got this from our daily bread on .org, so online, on the website. Okay, she gives this illustration. Four people, a pilot, a professor, a pastor, and a hiker were flying a small plane when the engines died. The pilot said there are only three parachutes. Since this is my plane, I'm taking one of them. He put it on and jumped out. The professor said, I'm brilliant, and the world needs me, so I'm taking a parachute. And he jumped out. Then the pastor told the hiker, I don't want to be too self- I don't. I don't want to be selfish, so you take the last parachute. The hiker replied, there are still two left, so we can each have one. The professor jumped out with my backpack. <laughs> so the professor thought he would land safely. His assurance was based on faulty things. And some people, she goes on to write, some people have an assurance of salvation based on faulty thinking. They believe that the church attendance, baptism, or just being good will gain them approval from God. But our, our thinking is faulty if it isn't based on what God says in His Word, where He talks about God says that all have sinned and that we are all His enemies. But through the death and resurrection of His Son, we, may, we can be made right with God. With faith in what Christ has done, we can have peace with God and the assurance of this eternal uh, life in heaven. Now, getting back to what John writes in his first letter, epistle, if you would call it that. In uh, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, he talks about God, he said, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so also are we in this world and then he talks about there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear John speaks of a confidence in the day of judgment, there is judgment coming but being assured of our salvation we will have this confidence we are sealed by the Spirit, and this gives assurance. And now, our assurance of salvation isn't guaranteed through some human legal contract. That's something to be thankful for. We all know that anything created by human hands has an end, it, and it can just fizzle and, and not be worth anything. Our, our guarantee is uh, sealed by the, the, you could say, the signet ring of the one and only king of kings. The seal of the royal documents had this, the, the ring of the king pressed into it, which the, would reveal which king it belonged to. And R.C. Sproul in his book uh, talking about Reformed Theology, he writes that the spirit acts like the, the signet ring of God. He, he makes what he calls an indelible mark, and that really just means permanent. It can't be removed. Mark on our souls, indicating his ownership of us. And the indwelling spirit sealing us shows this ownership. And these seals on these royal documents were also to prevent invasion. You, you weren't to break this seal and get in. It was to prevent anyone else from getting into this document. And Sproul also writes, 
Just as the tomb of Christ was sealed to prevent desecration by thieves and robbers, so we are sealed to prevent the evil one from snatching us from Christ, from the arms of Christ. So how can we really know that we have this assurance? We, we know that we have assurance that comes by the Spirit through the Spirit's own revelation founded upon God's Word. It's the Spirit that reveals it to us. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, writes, The source of assurance is the work of the Spirit convincing us that we are God's children and that the saving love and promises of God apply directly to us. So the assurance comes through the Spirit revealing it to us. It, it is a part of our identity. This identity is what we uh, is is who we are, what we are when we are one of His children. Uh, Packer writes about how this relates to our understanding of ourselves, and that that is really something that I have found really genuinely fruitful. Is to, it's not nice and pretty, and it, and it doesn't feel good at times, but to dig into ourselves. And why we are the way we are, and what you know, what is what has brought us to be who we are in many ways. He, he gives he gives some of these questions to ask, and um, he writes, "Do I, as a Christian, understand myself? Do I know my real identity, my own destiny, my own real destiny?" And he then gives answers that he says should be repeated, like morning, night, and when we have a minute, waiting for the bus, or whatever. He says any free moment, these, these truths from Scripture that, that we should repeat and get them into us so that we believe it, and, and saying, I am a child of God. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. My Savior is my brother. Every Christian is my brother too. Repeating these things again and again, that, that is our identity. We are His as Christians, and, and that's, that's it. And it's not based on what we do or, or, or anything that we, we can do, but whose we are. Our, my prayer, our prayer should be this morning... That every single person within the sound of my voice has this assurance that comes by the Spirit through faith in Christ. And having this assurance is something that I think uh, appropriately fits with Thanksgiving, uh, the holiday coming this week. We have, we have so much to be thankful for. And one, one practice that, that our family does, we go around the table uh, and we say, I think at least one, maybe two things that we are thankful for. Each person does it from young to old. You don't get out whether you're old or young. And, and we express thankful, thankfulness for family and for health and uh, for you know blessing of finances and friends. And uh, these are these are all really good things. They are. These are good things. But what what if all these things would be taken away? Would would we still be thankful? And that would be, it would be hard. And uh, I'm going to read something that I, that I found that is titled, Thank God for What We Cannot Lose. When we express our gratitude to God, it's easy to emphasize material prosperity and the qualities of life that are wonderful to have, but easy to lose. Good health is a great blessing, but it could be gone tomorrow and into the most Loving families and friendships, death intrudes when we least expect it. Our tables may be loaded with food today, but we could be out of work tomorrow and wondering about our next meal. How about taking a new approach to giving thanks on this Thanksgiving? Instead of focusing on the traditional areas of food, family, friends, let's, let's thank God for what we cannot lose. 
Romans 8, 35 and 39 is a great place to begin. After considering the difficulties and calamities that can strip away the externals from our lives, Paul concluded that none of them shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And God, God's love is unfailing, unceasing, unchanging, and unconquerable. And they go on to write, Heavenly Father, if we have to be away from home and family today, if we are frail in body or spirit, if there is any empty place in our heart, if we have nothing to eat, we still give thanks for you, for your love in Christ, because no person or problem can take your love away. Okay. I was debating on whether or not I'm going to share this, but I think I will. I I have uh, I've had meetings with uh, a spiritual director, and uh, it's usually monthly, but has been. But I just met with him this past week, and uh, usually when I meet with any of my uh, a spiritual director or a mentor or someone, they'll ask me how I'm doing, and my response is is either okay or pretty well. You know, and then, you know, I can go on to explain. And something he said to me, he said, well, what would it take for you to answer very well? And, you know, this is part of digging into yourself. And I thought, well, being a, a, a perfectionist mindset, mind, mindset it, it would take just about perfection to think for things for me to see them as really well, especially as spiritually, uh, in my own spiritual relationship with God. And, you know, there's this, there's this unreachable standard that I have. And I don't know where it comes from. I'm sure it comes from something in my past. I, I, I think it may even be culturally in this area where, you know, you work hard, you do things, and it, you know, you, you identify yourself by working hard and doing things right and, and getting it done. And you know, that to me was almost like, okay, God saved me. Yes, I really didn't do anything for that to happen. But yet I'm still working to please him. Like, like now after the salvation, after I'm in, I still have to work and please him and I'll do whatever this standard is I have. And he, and he said, Doug, you know, when, when Jesus was, was being baptized and then he came out of the water and, and God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And you know, he pointed out that when we are in Christ, God is pleased with us, not because of anything we have done. And he said, sit with that. Sit with that God saying to you, you are my son, you are my daughter with whom I am well pleased. And that's hard, because I want to work for his pleasing, for his almost Grace, further grace, but grace is all grace. It's grace coming in and it's grace that takes us home. And that's hard. It's hard to dig in and see he is pleased with us. And then I think what comes out of that, when we dwell on that, that God is pleased before we do anything and we say, man, what a, what a glorious God. What can I do out of this the, the fact that he is pleased with me? Then we respond with the fruits of the Spirit come out. We know that God loves us even as we are. And then the Spirit, you know, the, the Spirit gives us this assurance of who we are and whose we are. Our identity, our identity is in him. And the, the Spirit brings this assurance through this convicting and convincing by the word of God. And we have, we have this permanent mark 
on our hearts, on our souls, of whose we are. He owns us. And there is, there is really nothing, nothing that else that we can be more thankful for. There are so many things to be thankful for. But that tops it. If all these other things go away and are gone, he will never go away. We are His. And we can dwell in that assurance that He is pleased that we are His. And that's enough. From that we go and live for Him. Let's pray together. Father, Father, we do thank You. We thank You for by all the things, all the ways we see and all the things we even don't see. And Father, we thank you and praise you for what Jesus has done. We thank you for the spirit that dwells within us, that seals us, seals us. This permanent mark that reveals whose we are. And Father, we lift up anyone within the sound of my voice that doesn't have this seal. May you come upon them like a, like a, a fire that, that, that is burning so bright and, and the Spirit come within them and uh, make that mark. Father, turn their hearts from, from sin to salvation. And may they express faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and be marked permanently. Father, there is nothing more greater to be thankful for. Father, may we think about this. May we think about being your child. May we be thankful. May we express that. May it be shining from our very faces. Father, we thank you for all of this. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our next hymn together. Hymn five. 25. Come, be thankful people, come.
what it is that you believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Will the others please come forward and be welcome?
Peace be to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. May we go now and serve Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. 